are hoping to provide a really clear idea of where things are, taking stock of environmental commodity markets and where things could be headed. And I am uh, pleased to kind of launch us off. I'll start with just that higher level picture, a bit of history around environmental commodity markets, then uh, drilling down into carbon, where carbon markets are kind of today, what we're certainly keeping stock of around the world, key um, priority jurisdictions and those markets that are certainly keeping my community, AIDA, business community up at night in a good way, in a challenging way sometimes. Um, and then uh, I will pass it over to Nico to actually drill down and looking at some of the, the scale of these markets. Uh, and also, uh, as Chris mentioned, Nico and the Clear Blue Markets Gang, they engage with uh, compliance entities, major industry that are facing greenhouse gas regulatory compliance or understand the inevitability that it's coming. Uh, so some of the lessons learned uh, as Nico has been engaging with these groups all over the world, like myself. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we'll have Lenny that actually uh, looks at some of the unique traits and characteristics of environmental commodity markets, and then doing a bit of a deeper dive into some of the North American systems, um, including California uh, and Quebec, uh, and a few of the other uh, environmental markets that are happening. So, AIDA. We represent around 150 companies globally, uh, it's truly a multi-sector uh, nonprofit organization. We came out of the Kyoto process. So back in the 90s, in fact, this is our 20th year anniversary. I was very young back then. Um, so, uh, and we have probably about 50 to 60% of our members represent, again, those regulatory industries or the regulated industries, those who are facing uh, climate change compliance obligations, or again, understand the inevitability that it's coming. So major power, manufacturing, cement, steel, oil and gas, the whole gang. Um, then also financials, uh, project finance, clean investors, brokers, traders, uh, also assurance providers. So in our space with greenhouse gas markets, uh, assurance, the monitoring, reporting, verification, the data, means a lot, um, so we represent a lot of those groups. Uh, and lawyers, standards, greenhouse gas standards, the whole shebang. So I say that because uh, we certainly cannot get, uh, let's say, hijacked by special interests. We are truly about making sure that as governments move forward, because they are, and they're moving forward quickly uh, in climate change targets and ratcheting up ambition around their climate change targets and achieving real greenhouse gas reductions, that they're using markets. Uh, and so we as a business community globally, at state level, provincial level, regionally, and certainly national, and even at the UN level, which I'll get into in a little while, we engage with these governments, policymakers, to make sure that as they design, implement, modify, and hopefully harmonize and link these systems, that they'll do so in a way that works for business and markets um, while achieving climate goals. So uh, a bit of history. Uh, I'm just going to buzz through this, but who remembers acid rain? Show of hands, right? That was a situation. Um, acid rain was a situation in, uh, in the 90s. George Bush Sr., Republican, um, he signed on to the acid rain program, so the Clean Air Act 1990, and used cap and trade in order to tackle uh, sulfur dioxide uh, emissions coming from the power sector. And you had that then NOx, nitrogen oxide. Um, so the acid rain program continues to this day. Uh, then a nitrogen oxide budget trading program, 2003 um, to 2008, then came on board. You then had the clean air interstate rule, also dealing NOx, power sector units. Um, and then the CASPER. I promise not to have too many acronyms or I would you know, make sure I spell them out. Cross-state air pollution rule, um, where you're looking also at particulate matter. That was a com combination of three different cap and trade systems, and then CASPER, uh, so the cross-state air pollution rule, uh, and that was a combination of four different cap and trade systems. The key takeaway here, um, through the results of these systems, is we do not have to worry about acid rain anymore. Cap and trade did a very good job in harnessing the power of markets, capping those emissions, scaling those emissions down over time, and then allowing the um, power sector, the market, to innovate 
and to find least cost options, when to put on a scrubber, you know, when to wait, when to go to market um, to achieve compliance. And so really that's the story at the top is the SO2 emissions, so sulfur dioxide emissions scales down clearly over time. Um, and then the below is the message around the emissions um, caps for nitrogen oxide. So lessons from acid rain program or just broadly SOX, NOx, particulate matter programs that were born in the US, again, under Republican government leadership. Cap and trade works. Uh, it will cost less than expected. Lawmakers will probably underestimate not just the environmental benefits, but all the co-benefits that come along with that, health benefits, employment. Uh, if you constrain by the cap, allowing business the flexible options to comply, um, they will do so and they will innovate, provided there's stability and clarity in that market. It's gonna be around over time. Um, and uh, regional disparities can be overcome if properly designed and communicated. Political battles, obviously, are inevitable. They're gonna happen. And at that point in the 90s, 2000s, uh, cap and trade and carbon, they should, should be meant to be with one another. It makes all the sense in the world, but realizing the potential and scale um, for carbon and meaning dealing with climate change, greenhouse gas emissions through these mechanisms, through these market mechanisms and trading has been a bit of a turbulent journey. So I'm gonna take us on a bit of that ride for carbon, right? greenhouse gas emissions. 2007, you had just these little pockets, right, of these greenhouse gas markets, emissions trading systems. Uh, you had Europe, and then that big green bubble in North America, that's Alberta. So many people, I'm a Canadian, right, and many people say, you know, knock Alberta, but Alberta had the first compliance carbon market in North America in 2007. Uh, and lots, like Europe, of learnings came out of that program, and it still survives to this day, the Alberta system. Move forward a couple of years, you start having more bubbles crop up, including REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that comes, covers power sector, 2009, in the Northeast region of the US, and survives to this day. Now we get a bit more colorful. 2013, you start seeing other things crop up, including California and Quebec, uh, you have China that starts playing around with provincial cap and trade systems. Uh, and you have Australia. That kind of, well, Australia is a different beast I'll talk about later. Um, fast forward to last year, 2018. Now, to be fair, this is a carbon pricing snapshot. So there are some carbon taxes that are included in this map. Um, but most of the color jurisdictions that you see here um, are emissions trading systems, these carbon markets that are cropping up, okay? Obviously, a lot of the world is now becoming covered. The new report, so this is from the World Bank. It's State and Trends World Bank report. They issue it annually. Um, the new 2019 report is coming out over the next couple of weeks. So I, I say this, and there's another resource that's coming up too. These are kind of in our space, the gospels of where things stand on carbon markets. Uh, Let's bring it up a level to, uh, so Paris Agreement, climate change, international climate change agreement that was gaveled through in 2015. I, Paris Agreement, who's familiar with the Paris Agreement? Excellent. So we are in our community, the trenches of the international UN climate change negotiations. Really where our value add is and what we're engaging on are how can the international new Paris Agreement that comes into force next year in 2020, how can it enable markets and trading to take shape? In particular, how can countries that put forward their climate change targets cooperate with one another, trade units in order to reach their climate change targets or ratchet up the ambition of their climate change targets. So this map, and again, I take a step back. To be clear, on the road to the Paris Agreement in 2015, you had 195 countries that put forward their called nationally determined contributions, their climate change targets post-2020, okay? So 195 countries, they all now are in the tent. It's kind of a messy tent, right? There's all sorts of these climate change targets, 
Some are absolute targets. Some are greenhouse gas intensity-based reduction targets. Some are below a business-as-usual projection. But what this map shows us is everything in green or green-striped is that over 100 of these countries have indicated that they want to use markets or they need to use markets and trading in order to reach their goals. Or if they have access to these markets and trading for various reasons. It could be because they need access to lower cost greenhouse gas reductions. Or it could be because if they export some of their carbon, then they'll drive that financing to decarbonize. So, this has also propelled a lot of jurisdictions. So this broader kind of blueprint, now we have a Paris Agreement. We're working on that implementation agreement. It comes into gear next year. But it's also driven a lot of these jurisdictions to start exploring carbon markets and really take it seriously. Um, so the EU emissions trading system, again, it's kind of the old dog in the room. It's been around for a while. Nico will start, to, he'll get into some of the details around the coverage, the trends, what we've seen in the EU. An important takeaway for the EU emissions trading system, again, largest carbon market in the world, cap and trade, is that it, as its cornerstone to reaching its aggressive 2030 targets, greenhouse gas targets, the cap and trade system will remain that key tool in order to reach its goal. And there's been a lot of excitement even in recent weeks around the EU ETS. South Korea, it has had a cap and trade system online for the past couple of years, and it's over 500 facilities are covered. It's major industry, it's major power, coal fire power plants, it's, it's, it's um, major manufacturing and cement. So they have these compliance obligations and they're becoming now acclimated to this world. And they're also looking to cooperate with other countries and jurisdictions to potentially trade international units. China, where China goes, everybody cares about. It's big, um, and I, I had mentioned earlier, over the last couple of years, you've had these provincial cap and trade systems that have bubbled up, Shenzhen, Huangdong, Shanghai, Beijing. Now, it's becoming a national cap and trade system, okay, in China, and they're taking it very seriously, and it's come next year that we will see the initial coverage of a national program in China. And that's just power sector as its first step, potentially moving to other bigger industries over the coming years. But coverage of the power sector alone in China is around two and a half to three billion tons of carbon dioxide. So translate that into allowances that have financial value and compliance value, and then the price. You can see why a lot of the world is watching, but also why it's critical that as China designs and executes its program, it's done well. <laughs> Australia, just, just a point, the election is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, the likely uh, new leader has made sure that climate change action and international markets and carbon markets will be um, an area of priority for their new government. So watch that space. Pacific Alliance, so this is Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru. Many of them, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia, recently went through their elections, um, and they all have uh, new, confident governments that embrace climate action and staying true to their climate change targets, but also that carbon pricing and that market com carbon market component and cooperation will be a priority for that group. Um, and Mexico, uh, You'll have Nico that digs into the latest news from Mexico, but that's an interesting, important one to watch over the coming months. Uh, you have Oregon and Washington. So again, Lenny will talk about California and Quebec and a few other markets. But right now in Oregon, you have a cap and trade bill that's going through session. We expect it to be uh, adopted by the end of the session in June. Uh, Reggie, I already mentioned the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So again, it's power sector only at this stage, but as of yesterday, they had their first consultation around the Transportation Climate Initiative because now this group of Northeast states um, and others, including Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C., are looking at what models to use to deal with transportation emissions, not just power, but transport emissions, big guys. And they are looking at 
a cap and trade style to deal with transport emissions. So something to watch, and they're going to be finalizing their recommendations by the end of this year. I just want to say a quick thing about Washington, D.C. Um, you have Congressman Tonko, who has recently released. It's a principles document to inform future congressional action on climate change. He'll soon be coming out with a more detailed white paper uh, to inform, again, we are not obviously going to see a national carbon price or cap and trade system in the US this year or next, but now is the time to start canvassing, doing the education and outreach there for future congressional action. Emissions trading, lower cost options um, are absolutely on the table uh, and are gradually getting a lot of attention. Huh. Last but not least, that's an airplane. Um, so the aviation sector right now is also in the throes of developing the first ever global sectoral carbon market. They have net zero carbon neutral growth goals for the international aviation community. So right now, they are working on the design and execution of the global carbon offsetting program. Uh, so this is again something, it's all happening in very real, real time. It's happening very quickly. And where aviation goes on this, watch the maritime sector because it can follow. Uh, it can be a bit gnarly sometimes, right? Because there's been a lot of fragmentation of these markets. But in recent years, what we've seen and very much welcome, our governments are starting to talk about this a lot more frequently and a lot more seriously and in more detailed context around how to align and harmonize these markets. Not necessarily because you're gonna have fungible credits, right, and commodities that are going between China and California tomorrow, but they are working on making sure that the foundational components are in place to allow for that linkage, harmonization, fungibility potentially down the line. So these are kind of the pillars. I, I do a snapshot of the Americas because last year you had the carbon pricing in the Americas declaration with states and provinces and many countries including Canada, Chile, Mexico, Peru that signed on to working together on their carbon markets and carbon pricing broadly alignment. So um, this is, uh, and these are the pillars or the, the kind of the work plan components. So working together on the monitoring, reporting, verification, carbon accounting, on link linkage, what could linkage compatibility, fungibility look like, addressing competitiveness concerns for a major industry. G7 also has a carbon market platform. They're meeting again in I think it's a week or two in France as the host. So again, they're working together on best practices, lessons learned in order to, for the G7 countries to have some kind of clear, consistent roadmap on carbon markets as they execute or modify their systems. You also have the EU, and you, that's Joss Delbecke. He's the former uh, head of uh, DG Klima, regulators in the European Union. Um, he now is establishing the Florence dialogue process. Uh, and this is where you have the Chinas New Zealand's and others that are really opening up about the current state of play and some of the data to inform these markets and the opportunities. Last but not least, I just, that climate summit, um, New York in September, this is a very, very important milestone for the entire global community, um, including the climate uh, business community. This is where the UN Secretary General has asked for businesses um, but more importantly, governments, to come to New York in September with plans, tangible plans, to not just reach these climate change commitments they've already made, but again, how to dig deeper and ratchet up that level of ambition, that stringency. So over the coming months, literally, you're going to have a lot of governments that are working away to figure out what key elements or ingredients do they need in order to actually put forward a tangible plan to increase their level of climate change ambition for September. And this is where Article 6, this is the market's provision of Paris. So going back to my green and blue slide, where you have all of these countries that say, we appreciate we need markets in order to meet our ambition or again, ratchet up 
meet our climate change target or ratchet up ambition. So we appreciate the importance of a good Article 6 decision in the Paris rulebook, these markets, the guidance, the accounting. But we also need to start to quantify it. And this is one of my final slides here. So last year, and really earlier this year, we started, uh, it's a modeling project with the University of Maryland. And it was looking at, OK, what is the potential economic value of an, an Article 6? So Article 6 being markets, cooperation between countries, allowing for environmental commodities, carbon commodities to transfer. Um, what's the potential size in the market? Who would be the sellers? Who would be the buyers of these units? How much additional climate ambition could be achieved? This is a project that is still underway. These are just the preliminary findings that I show up here right now. But right now, ballpark conservative estimates. The estimated potential of cost savings in aggregate for the world if countries were allowed to use markets and trading in order to reach their goals, you're looking at ballpark $250 billion a year by 2030. Again, in the cost savings by allowing for the efficiencies of trading. It ratchets up over the century, 2050, we're looking at $350 billion a year in cost savings. And then if you were to actually translate that cost savings into greenhouse gas mitigation activities, that is where we say the mitigation could be enhanced, that level of ambition could be enhanced by around five gigatons of carbon dioxide removals and reductions a year. That matters, and that is starting to stick with a lot of governments and decision makers around the world. So when they go to New York in September, and they all say, you know, we are looking for these special ingredients to ratchet up ambition of our climate targets, the carbon markets piece is absolutely core to this. So it's a big piece of communication that we're working on now. Um, and I think that uh, it's certainly starting to come to light. And you're starting to see the, the trends globally around how these markets will hopefully continue to not just survive and grow, but thrive. OK, um, that's enough for me. Um, I'm going to just, this is the other resource. And this is what uh, Nico will start to dig deeper on. This was, uh, it's called the International Carbon Action Partnership. So if we're the voice of business, right, around carbon markets, um, this is the government. They issue a report every year on the latest design, coverage, expectations for their systems, and it was just released recently. Um, and Nico is going to provide a bit of a snapshot on some of the highlights from this report and beyond. Thank you very much.